Thank you, Anne, for reading that to us. The supremacy of Jesus Christ, and it's my privilege to talk about this this morning. We're in a series at the moment um, called Planet Wise, or based on a book called Planet Wise. <clears throat> and we're looking at uh, the earth and how we have a responsibility of looking after the earth. And this morning, I'm not going to be telling you to recycle milk bottles or anything like that. It's going to, we're going to be looking at what is God's relationship to the earth and looking at his relationship to the planet and what the implications are for us in all of that. So I, I've got quite a few things to share this morning, a few little kind of tasters, canapes if you like. Um, so what, what I want you to do this morning is if, if God speaks to you about one particular thing, because I, I know for a fact that I can get up here and give a talk and you won't remember most of it. Okay, even I won't remember most of it by tomorrow. <laughs> okay, because when we read books or we hear talks, there are little bits that stick out for us. Um, you know, some of you know that I, I went to be a, a missionary overseas. And the reason I did was because I read the title of a book. The title of the book changed my life. Okay, and sometimes a paragraph in a book can change your life. Um, or sometimes just a little line that someone says. So if God's going to speak to you this morning through something, just, just remember what that thing is. Maybe make a note of it or something. I don't expect you to remember everything. But we believe that God wants to speak to us this morning uh, because we're getting into the Bible and that is God's word to us. So let's pray as we start. <clears throat> so you are most welcome here, Lord Jesus. We're, we're going to be talking about you and we're going to be talking about you and your glory. And so I pray that as we listen, as we think about your word, as we meditate on your word, would you speak to our hearts and our minds, Lord? And if there's something you want us to do in response, then help that to stick with us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So <clears throat> this reading that we, we just had from the book of Colossians, written by Paul to uh, a church in Colossae nearly 2,000 years ago. And just this little reading gives us a huge explanation of the world and why we're here and what it exists for. So I'm just going to be pulling out a few bits, as I said, from, from the passage. And the first thing is, let's just read one of the verses that we just read. For in Jesus, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. So, the first thing when we look at this planet and we try to understand how we're supposed to look after the planet is to understand that Jesus created all things. <clears throat> and things that are visible, things like rocks and trees and animals and water, the person next to you, your body, everything that you have at home, all things were created by him. And things that were invisible, what are the invisible things? Well, there's lots of things, aren't there? There's the, the wind, uh, there's all the forces of science that we look to measure, that we can't actually see physically. Um, things like music, can't see music, but it exists, and it's God's idea. And uh, then there's the spiritual world, which some scientists would say don't, don't exist because we can't see them and measure them. Whereas most of the world, for most of history, knows they do exist. That spiritual forces in that many realms do exist. The world of angels and demons and, and heaven and hell and curses and blessings, all these kinds of things. So <clears throat> when we're looking at Jesus and his creation, remembering that he created everything and he created all these things that are measured in science too. And uh, I was just looking up about, I'm no scientist, okay, so I had to do some research uh, looking at science, but everything on earth, um, everything ever observed with all our instruments, all normal matter adds up to less than 5% of the universe. That's what a lot of scientists were saying. We actually have seen and measured less than 5% of the universe. So, all these things that God has created, and we're still discovering some of these things that God has created. So everything was made by him. 
What are the implications for that? Why is that important that we understand that everything is made by him? Well, firstly, everything belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. If he made it, then it belongs to him. And that has big implications for us. So I want you to just close your eyes for a moment. <clears throat> I want you to close your eyes and now go home. Go to your home and walk around your home. Look at the things that you have. Look at the things that you sit on, the, 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 the furniture in your house. Think of the things that you, you treasure that are inside your, your drawers that are, are closed away maybe, or the clothes in your cupboard. And then maybe if you have a car, looking outside your house, looking at your car, at your vehicle. Everything belongs to him. And that has implications for us. And then as we go outside of our homes and think of the, the footpaths, maybe you like going for walks. Just picturing the footpaths or the mountains or hills that you climbed or the foreign beaches that you sat on and the sea that you swum in or the great cities that you visited. Everything belongs to him. And you know, understanding this makes us thankful for the things that he's given us. You can open your eyes. And when we consider that everything was made by him, then it makes us want to use them well. The guy who wrote the book, Planet Wise, I, I, um, like I say, I'm, I'm not a great reader, okay? If you give me a book to read, it would probably take me about a year to read it. Because what I do, I, I read a page and I think about it for a week. Um, so, but I just, I read the back of the, the, the book, Planet Wise. I did read more than just the back of the book. But uh, the author, Dave Bookless, who, who wrote this book, he said, I was in the act of throwing away my family's rubbish while I was on holiday on a beautiful island. When God spoke to me, he said, how do you think about, how do you think I feel about what you're doing to my world? And that's why he wrote the book, because he understood that everything belongs to him. God says it's my world, and so that's why we look after it. <clears throat> so understanding that everything was made by him puts us in perspective and the size that we are. The psalmist in Psalm 8 says this, When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and stars that you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? So everything was made by him and for him. When we understand that everything was made by Jesus, it also helps us to understand some of his actions. You know, when, when Jesus was on this earth, we know that he did lots of miracles. And when he did the miracles, it, it wasn't just some uh, mystic man in the past doing some magic. When Jesus was doing the miracles, when, when, when he was healing people, it was the creator repairing the things that he made. When he healed the sick, when he calmed the storm, it was Jesus bringing under control the elements that he'd made. So everything was made by him. Why was it that when Jesus was confronted with a demon-possessed person, the demons cried out, we know who you are. Just imagine, the demons were face to face, and they knew it, they were face to face with their creator. And that's why they were terrified when they saw Jesus. Everything was made by him, and everything was made for him. You know, the New Testament, makes it very clear that everything exists for God's glory. Everything exists, including you. It's no wonder it's so beautiful. You know, we sang that song about how beautiful you are. I see the sun and it tells me how beautiful you are. The heavens, the earth, everything was made for the glory of God. What an amazing thing. It was made for him. That's what it said in that verse. Everything was made by him. Everything was made for him. And you know, for thousands of years, philosophers have wrestled with the, the kind of questions, the big questions of, why are we here? Why do you exist? And my guess is most people in the world at some point in their life will ask that question. It would kind of be strange never to ask that question, like, why am I here? Why, why do I exist? But to know for us as, as followers of Jesus that we, we exist for him gives us a great hope and a great purpose, doesn't it? So, 
That's what discipleship is. You know, Jesus doesn't want just people who believe in him. He wants disciples. And disciples realize that they exist for him. I exist for Jesus and for his glory. That's why I live. I live for him, for him and his glory. I'm a disciple of him. And so my life is devoted to knowing him better. And I'm sure you, many of you agree with that. And that's why you're here this morning. I want to know him. I want to know him better. Because he's the reason I exist. And I want to live a life that pleases him. Because I exist for him. So I, I want my life to be, to be for him. And it frees us from selfishness. You know, when we know that we live for something greater than ourselves or someone greater than ourselves, it frees us from a kind of a selfless life that becomes all about me and my happiness, which as most of us would know, would lead to misery <laughs> because people always let you down. But when I know that I exist for him, it gives me a hope and a purpose. So we exist for the glory of God. And so when we do things like we look after the planet Earth, as we've been talking about, when we care for it, when we don't just throw our rubbish down, when we look to do things that can sustain, sustain planet Earth, this is one of our acts of worship. It's an act of worship saying, God, this is yours. I'm going to look after it. That's part of our discipleship. So everything was made for him. So we know why we, we, why we exist. But we also know that because it was made for him, he loves the world so much that he cares for it. God really cares about the world that we've made, the physical world around us. We get a little glimpse of this in the book of Job. Now, if you remember the book of Job, it's, it's this extraordinary book where <laughs> this man who's very wealthy and has um, many things and worships God. And God, God recognizes this man as, one of, as the most righteous man on earth. And you know the story where Satan comes and bargains with God about attacking Job. And God gives him certain uh, limits, but Job is attacked. And then the, the, most of the book is Job's three friends and Job having a debate about why Job is suffering. And towards the end of the book, God suddenly speaks. Because they're all asking, why is God allowing suffering? Well, it's because of this, it's because of that, it's because you did this, because you didn't do that. And then suddenly God speaks. And God's answers are very surprising, because actually God doesn't answer the question. And here's just a couple of the things. What God does, God speaks about his creation. And he speaks about the world that he's made. And he asked Job, where were you when all these things happened? Can you do this? Can you do that? And one of the verses that <coughs> I've pulled out is this from Job 38. God said this to Job, who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert? to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout without grass. So what he's saying there in that verse is, Job, there's all these places in the world that you've never seen, that man has never been to before. A land, when, a place where no one lives. And I know those places and I care for them. I cut channels so that water can go to them. I make the grass grow in places that mankind will never see. God sees all the little insects that live in the deserts that we'll never see. He sees all the, the things that are going on in the trees around here that we will never see. Because it's for him. The world was created for him and for his glory. And we get to enjoy it. Isn't that amazing? So all things were made by him. They were made for him. And he really cares for it. And he really loves the world that he lives in. There is so much of creation that we don't see, so much that we don't know. And as I was looking into this this week, you know, two thirds of the world, the planet is under the sea. Okay, two thirds of this world is sea where, where no one actually lives, uh, or humans don't live. <clears throat> Yet only less than 10% of our oceans have been explored. 
We know very little about God's creation, less than 10%. When we think of space, thinking of the stars, we only know a tiny fraction of what's out there. I was looking at some t- statistics. You, some of you may know the Hillsong uh, song about 100 billion, um, with 100 billion. I think it's called uh, So Will I, that's the song. Um, I discovered this week that 100 billion number in that song is not just a random number. It's actually a number that means a lot to us. So, um, so we know a tiny fraction of what's out in space. You know, just in our Milky Way, just in our Milky Way, we know that there are about 400 billion stars in our Milky Way and probably the same number of planets. Okay? That's just our Milky Way. We know that there are 125 billion galaxies. Just think of the size of that. And they were created, they were made by a designer because they're all held in balance. Man has only explored a handful. Now, does, does anyone know how to find the North Star, the Pole Star? Does anyone know how to do that? Only one person here? Okay, a couple of people. I'll tell you how it is, I know. So, you know the plow. If you look out for the, in, into a clear sky, you see the plow, okay. If you follow the plow down and then up, it's like a, a, a saucepan, isn't it? Down and up, and then follow it to the next bright star, that's the pole star, it's the north star. It's by which, am I right? Yeah, yeah good, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's the star by which uh, people navigate, you know, you used to navigate on the seas. And, okay, if you look at, you can see that quite clearly, the North Star. Now, how far away is the North Star? Well, light travels at 186,000 miles per second, okay? So we measure long distances by light years. So how far light will travel in one year? Okay, if you think it's going 186,000 miles per second, that's seven times around the world in one second. How far away is the, the North Star? Now this is one we can see, and we can't see most of, the, most of even our galaxy. Okay, the light that you will see, if you look at the North Star tonight, left that star 434 years ago. Okay, 434 years ago, and I looked up, what happened 434 years ago? That's the year that Mary, Queen of Scots, was beheaded. Okay, so when you see the North Star tonight, the year that she was beheaded is when the light left that star. It's possible it doesn't even exist anymore, that star. We don't know, because it, the light left it so long ago. But God has such a special relationship with much of his creation that humans have never seen. So we need to understand this, that it's, it's not that God has just created this planet. He loves this planet. Okay, he loves this planet and everything in it. And he loves the stars and the, and the planets that are out there in the universe. He has a very special relationship with it. And Jesus, we, we see that he loved it too. You know, I was thinking about his parables this week. And in just about one minute, I thought, okay, what, what things did he use in creation for, for his parables? So in one minute, this is what I wrote down. Seeds, birds, trees, flowers, thorns, pearls, yeast, fish, wheat, bread, Harvest, storms, rocks, mountain, fruit, mountains, fruit, vineyards, light, darkness, building houses. Okay, that's just the ones I could think of in a minute. There's probably more than that. But Jesus, Jesus was basically telling us stories and saying, become familiar with my creation. Consider the birds of the air. Don't just know that. He says, watch them. Okay, consider the birds of the air, consider the lilies of the field. Jesus is telling us to become bird watchers and botanists. This is what Jesus is doing. You know, I remember when we used to live in Turkey, my, uh, we, we had this young guy on our team, I think he was about 13 years old, and he did something I wouldn't expect 13-year-old boys to normally do, but he, he, I remember during one of our meetings he said, he said, this week I just sat and watched a flower for an hour. He said, I just sat there and looked at it. 
And he said, it was such an amazing experience just looking at this flower for an hour. I just learned so much. And sometimes it's good for us to just stop and consider some of the things that God is doing in creation. Maybe that's something you'd want to do, sit and watch a flower for an hour. But we can just enjoy all these things. And that's what he wants us to do. You know, there's a verse I, I love in, in uh, the book of Timothy, where Paul writes to Timothy and he says this. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Isn't that amazing? We're not like Buddhists. The idea of Buddhism is to get to a state where you don't feel anything about anything. God has given us these things for our enjoyment. Okay, take pleasure in the things that you see around you. Take pleasure in your garden. Take pleasure when you, when you climb a mountain, when you go for walks. Take pleasure in swimming in the sea. All these have been given for our enjoyment. And I, it belongs to him. And I, I, think, I think probably the closest analogy I could think of is, is like the wealthy owner of a house who lives in the house and he said, to, he said to us, come and be my gardener. So when we think about looking after this planet Earth, we're living with God in this place. And he's saying, look after it and enjoy it. Enjoy my garden and take care of it. God really loves the things that he's made. All of this was made by him and for him. Just quickly moving on. Then the next verse said this, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You know, Jesus cares for and protects what belongs to him. He won't abandon it. He is holding it together. There's a particular philosophy called deism. I don't know if you've heard of that before, deism. It's actually becoming very popular among youth in the Muslim world, I was reading recently. Deism is kind of a belief that, that God, there is a God, that he created everything, so there is a designer behind everything. But he's not really that interested in the world. And it's an explanation for why is there so much suffering. Well, it must be that God is not interested in the world. So it's, it's like he, he made this thing, he wound it up, he set it on its course, and he just let it go. And he's not interested in it. And so it's all down to us to look after this earth and look after everything in it. That's what deism teaches. But this verse was teaching us, no, in him all things hold together. And without him, everything would fall apart. We know from science, okay, we've discovered a lot of things in the last couple of hundred years, but one of the main things we've discovered is that this universe and the world that we live in, is in a, has an incredibly fine balance. Where if something was even just very slightly off, everything would fall apart. Now, I can't go into all the, the details of that science right now, but um, everything is held in a very delicate balance. Without trees, there would be no oxygen. Without animals, there would not be enough carbon dioxide. Then there's the water cycle, the evaporation, the rain, the, the water cycle that happens. The temperature of the earth is exactly right for life. What is even more amazing is that despite the major changes in the climatic conditions that we're facing now, this fragile balance has been preserved, that it's still being preserved. And it's because God is holding it all together. That's how we understand the Bible. So many people are so astounded by this that they, we actually talk about the earth. Some people talk about the earth as though it's some kind of li living organism and talk about mother earth and mother nature. But we know that the New Testament tells us that Jesus is dynamically involved in his creation. So I think for us as followers of Jesus, as believers in Jesus, we can take great comfort 
that actually when we look at the, the problems we are facing with the rising temperatures and these things on earth, to know that Jesus is actually holding it all together. And that should make us thankful rather than greedy. And we know how it's going to end. You know, some are predicting there's going to be a complete collapse of civilization or the end of, end of the world. My wife Cindy was telling me the other day she was uh, on her, while she was at work, she was driving in the car listening to the Jeremy Vine show on Radio 2. And there was a call in talking about how's the world going to end. Talk about depressing at lunchtime, eh? <clears throat> and people were calling in with their theories about how the world was going to end. But because we have this, because we have God's word, we know how it's going to end. And it won't end by something we do. It'll end when he comes back, as Chelsea prayed earlier. So as powerful as we think we are as human beings, we will not bring about this planet's ultimate end or the end of the human race. We know that God is looking after the earth. He's holding it together. He is the sustainer of the earth. In him, as it said in Colossians, all things hold together, not, not us. So maybe what's going on right now with all the, the political discussions that are going on, maybe it's God's wake-up call to some of us. I believe that's what it is. It's God's wake-up call to start looking after his planet in a more sustainable way. So what does this mean for us? Well, you know, God did give us a responsibility. When he made Adam and Eve at the beginning, he made humans, he put humans on the earth and he gave them a very special place. He said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and all the small animals that scurry along the ground. He blessed the humans and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Manage the earth, have mastery over it. So he gave us a very responsible job to do. He did not give that job to dolphins or elephants or lions or monkeys. He gave it to us. It's our job to manage what goes on the earth. So what is going to help this planet move, move towards, or help humans move towards sustaining this planet. You know, again, as in Chelsea's prayer, it was mentioned that not all countries are buying into this, you know, what we've been talking about. And uh, some of the bigger countries have not bought into it, and the ones that will actually have the most effect. That's why I love my job. My job, without going into too much detail, is to mobilize and train people who are gonna to go to the nations and take the good news of Jesus to the nations. I have the privilege of being in that job. It's, it's the best job on earth because I meet some of the most interesting, uh, fascinating people on earth who are, going to, who are giving up their, their ambitions and going to very tough places to make a difference in this world. All the people that go are passionate about making disciples of Jesus. They're passionate about making disciples of Jesus. They're passionate about starting churches where churches don't exist at the moment. And what I love about them is many of them are doing some of these things we've been talking about. We've got people teaching farming in desert places. People who specialize in farming in deserts. Can you imagine? British people specializing in that. We've got marine scientists demonstrating how to care for the seas. We've got water engineers finding ways of preserving rainwater that can be used in the dry season in the desert. We've got, I just heard this week of a, a, a couple that we have somewhere in Africa, I don't want to give a location away, but somewhere in Africa making disciples of Jesus and they just started a recycling business in a country that doesn't recycle. Isn't that cool? We've got people uh, designing water purification units or rooftop gardens, all these kinds of things. But they're passionate about, first and foremost, about making disciples of Jesus. You know, the problem with this world <laughs> and the problem with the environmentalist issue is not a lack of education. 
The problem is the human heart. And we know it's the gospel that will change human hearts, that will, that will stop greed. And that's why we emphasize the gospel. It's why Jesus didn't tell us to go and um, just look after the environment. Jesus told us to go and make disciples of the nations. Because we as Christians, when we really walk with God, we understand that our walk with God means looking after the things that he's given us and not being greedy. So our looking after this planet is an act of worship. It is an act of worship. And we want to see worshippers of Jesus all over the world. So I'm going to call the band up now. And as they come up, I just want you to close your eyes now. And as I said at the beginning, just think, Lord, is, is there one thing that you want to stick with me? Is there one thing you want to stick? Is there one thing you're asking me to do? Maybe that thing that God is asking you to do is just to say thank you or to worship him. Or maybe it might be a change in lifestyle or a change in attitude to the things that we have. So Lord, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for the beauty of your creation. Thank you that you've given us the job of being your gardeners. Thank you for that responsibility and the joy that comes with that. Thank you that we have a, a purpose for our existence. And we thank you that you are holding everything together that is not down to us. And we thank you that we have hope because we know the end of the story. Thank you, Jesus, you're coming back and you will restore all things to yourself. And Lord, we ask that you would teach us how to live lives that are worthy of your name. As we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, as we show love and care for other people and care for your creation. Lord, teach us, Lord, how to live lives that are pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our final song. It gives us 10,000 reasons to worship him. So, thank you.